Now look, I know here at Redriven we generally focus on reviewing primarily used cars, but when you're offered an exclusive on an all new model and a fully electric AMG one at that, it's an offer far too good to pass up. So people of the internet, are you ready? We're about to review the all new AMG ML63 EV convertible. Now guys, we know you're probably as excited as we are to get into the nitty gritty of this thing, to see you know, what it's like to live with on a daily basis, what goes wrong with it, what it's like to drive. But before we get into all of that, we need to set the scene for what this new AMG even is. See, Mercedes retired the ML moniker for their larger SUVs back in 2019, replacing it with the GLE title. But as this is an all-new, more compact convertible model on an all-new platform, it seems that Mercedes have reintroduced the ML badge and the name, as adding yet another GLE to the already crowded GLE range would be confusing for this vehicle's target market. But why not call it the EQE, like other Mercedes EV SUVs? That's a great question, but what we have here is the very latest in EV tech. The platform itself and every body panel is made from high strength but lightweight composite plastic. Even the wheels are lightweight to keep the unsprung mass to a minimum. And just like the Tesla Model 3 performance, this features two electric motors and the full suite of technology and features, which we'll cover more in a second. Now, as far as trim levels go, AMG have only released this single variant, but we do know that other manufacturers like Toyota, Jeep, Rolls-Royce, McLaren, and even Lamborghini are starting to dabble into this market as well. Now obviously there are a bunch of other details about this thing and if you do need all the specific details about the ML63 EV, jump on redriven.com and check out our awesome and free redriven cheat sheets. It'll answer all the questions you have about this new model. Now let's talk about the looks. See, Range Rover, they did the kind of convertible SUV thing with the Evoque, and for me, that was a complete fail. But what AMG have done, they've kept the A, B, and C pillars to make it more of like a, a target top than a true convertible, and I think they've nailed it. I feel like it just, this makes more sense than that horrible looking Evoque. Now, in terms of size, this thing is far smaller than any other Mercedes or AMG SUV before it. In fact, it might even be smaller than the current Suzuki Jimny. In fact, it looks, I hate to say this, almost cartoonish, almost like it's a, like a kid's version of an actual SUV. But also with the exterior, there are a few little gremlins here and there, but we'll cover those shortly. Actually, before we get into what the interior is like, we've got to talk about getting in and out of it. The good thing is, because the door apertures are so large, getting in and out is actually a breeze. Hang on. Now design wise, look, I'm gonna be honest here, it doesn't exactly exude the same levels of like class and prestige that we are used to with Mercedes. Even the materials used, like there's like heaps of hard plastics everywhere, there's not a lot of leather. Even some of the, squ the switch gear, it just feels kind of a bit low quality, a little bit low rent. Even some of the panel gaps, not great. In fact, Mercedes are often accused of having lower build quality levels than what they used to make back in the 80s and even sort of early 90s. And yeah, this car is, Unfortunately, a good example of that. Now, I'm exactly 14 centimetres taller than seven-time Formula One world champion and AMG Mercedes driver Lewis Hamilton. This is in my normal driving position, and I'll be honest, it's a little bit cramped. Like, waist up, no dramas at all because it is a convertible, but from waist down, yeah, like, it's, it does feel very squishy. Plus, these are, being an AMG, these are a performance seat, so there's not a lot of cushioning, and they're not the most comfortable seat either. Now, as far as wear and tear in this particular car goes, look, this is a development vehicle, pre-production vehicle, so you've got to expect a few little you know, scratches and dents. And yeah, we are seeing that, like some of the uh, the trim around the center console here has gone a little bit loose. And just overall wear and tear, it just feels a bit grubby and dirty. Actually, ironically, it's a very similar issue down here to what we saw on the Mercedes-Benz S-Class when we reviewed that. The link for that video is just up there, but hmm, interesting. Now, as far as practicality goes, this is a weird one because it is a four-door SUV, yet it only features two seats. There's no rear seat. It's almost like a smart car with four doors. So I don't really know. Look, I get this, you know, everybody wants a crossover vehicle, that, you know, one car that kind of does it all, but the fact it's an SUV with, you know, not a lot of practicality, yeah, why? Now, practicality in the boot, I feel like we've kind of gone back in time to the original Fast and the Furious movies because there is no boot. It's taken up by this bloody big speaker system. Mercedes, it's an SUV. Where's the utility representation of that acronym? Now, as far as tech and features goes, even though this is the very latest in EVs from Mercedes, 
it is lacking in tech. You do have an auxiliary input for the sound system, which sounds, even with the speakers in the boot, honestly pretty average. It does have a touch screen, but there are issues with that, and we'll get to those soon. And like many modern EVs, it can be driven via an app or a remote control. It also has a horn, but unfortunately, like all manufacturers at the moment, they seem hell-bent on pumping engine sounds into the cabin. Mercedes, we can tell that this is not the actual engine. What are you doing? Come on. Unfortunately, technology like Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, parking sensors, even a reversing camera, none of that stuff is fitted standard. But the good news is you can fit all that stuff easily with aftermarket gear. Now, as far as safety goes, look, ANCAP haven't tested the ML63 EV as of yet, and even though it is built on the very latest when it comes to composite monocoque technology, the list of safety features is lacking a little bit. To take you through what it does have, here's another voiceover. Again, guys, for the full breakdown of all the tech, the features, and the safety equipment, just jump on redriven.com and check out that cheat sheet. So what's it like to drive? Well, to make this section of the video a little bit more engaging, let's break it down into chapters. Power. So guys, it is a fully electric AMG model, so you're gonna expect some pretty amazing performance. And here we go. Okay, it's, uh, it certainly pins you to the seat. That might be because I'm so squished in here, I can't be anything but pinned to the seat, but it's actually pretty quick. Steering. We're so used to electric steering systems feeling a bit vague, but this thing feels so connected, almost like there's no electric assistance at all. Ride and handling. Suspension-wise, look, the ride is on the firm side, but, you know, it is a performance car. You've got to expect that. Also, there's a few odd noises coming from the rear suspension, almost like it's a bit overloaded with weight or something. As far as handling goes, look, I don't think these are performance tyres because through the corners, it does feel a little bit sketchy, but it's fun. Look, when we were told that we are going to be driving a convertible performance SUV, I thought this thing was going to be terrible, but it does offer a really unique driving experience. I don't think it's for everyone, and I kind of even question if I'm the target market. Now, as you can see from the graphic, the ML63 EV, it does undercut other AMG SUVs by many thousands of dollars, so it might seem like a bargain. But it is a very niche vehicle and it has little to no practicality, plus other electric SUVs in the market, like say the Kia EV6 or the Polestar 2, do offer far more features. Now a big concern with many in the EV market is range anxiety and the infrastructure involved in charging the car. But the good news is, Mercedes have implemented technology that means if you plug this thing into your wall socket at home, to charge from 0 to 100% only takes 3 to 5 hours, whereas other manufacturers, that can take 10 to 15 hours, which despite its shortcomings, it's pretty impressive. Now, as far as the range anxiety question goes, look, it's going to vary depending on who's driving it, how they're driving it, and where they're driving it. But I think it's pretty safe to say this thing, Sydney to Melbourne on one charge, pretty unlikely. Okay, now what goes wrong with these? Let's start with the exterior. There are some reports that due to the body panels being made out of that lightweight composite material, sometimes they can just get a little bit, a bit stuck and a little bit loose and they just sometimes don't fit together properly. Now, as you can see on this particular car, there are a few little scratches and dents. It's important to remember that this is a pre-production development vehicle, so a few little scratches like this, they are to be expected because it's a prototype. In saying that, but many of the people that will be buying these are inexperienced drivers and there are no parking sensors on the car. So when these do get on the used market, you can expect a few scratches like this. Also, we don't know if this is like a Mercedes-Benz feature. Mercedes fans, you can let us know. But it seems like the window tint on the uh, rear windows here have gone, it's gone a little bit milky. Now, what goes wrong inside? Well, as we've already mentioned, thanks to the harsh Australian climate and lack of roof in this car, yeah, some of the trim can just peel off. Also, in this particular car, the touch screen is completely not responsive. No matter what we try, what button we push, it's just locked on the one screen. Also, and this is a really odd one, no matter where you drive this, Kids seem to want to get in and have a go and have a drive. It's really bloody annoying. Now, guys, before we get into mechanically or electronically what can go wrong with these, a massive thank you to Mercedes Australia for hooking us up with this exclusive model and this exclusive review. Thank you guys so much. Now, mechanically or electronically, what goes wrong with these things? Well, look, I can't tell you because I'm not a qualified mechanic, but Jim is. Now, when it comes to an all-new EV and all of the new high-tech stuff, a lot of people do struggle to understand what's going on. But when you break it down into its smaller pieces, it's actually pretty straightforward. For a number of years now, AMG 
and specifically Bud Haggart and his team have been proceeding in order to bring perfection to the crudely conceived idea of a transmission that would not only supply inverse reactive current for use in unilateral phase detractors, but would also be capable of automatically synchronizing cardinal grammeters. Such a device is the AMG turbo encabulator. Now basically the only new principle on the ML63 EV is that instead of power being generated by the relative motion of conductors and fluxes, it's produced by the modal interaction of magneto, reluctance and capacitive directance. The new design has a base plate of pre-famulated amulite surmounted by a malleable logarithmic casing in such a way that the two spurving bearings were in a direct line with a panometric fan. Genius. The latter simply consisted of six hydrocoptic marzal vanes so fitted to the ambiofacient lunar wane shaft that side fumbling was effectively prevented. The main winding in the ML63 EV is of the normal lotosoid delta type placed in panometric semiboloid slots of the stator and every seventh conductor being connected by a non-reversible tremie pipe connected to a differential girdle spring on the upper end of the grammatus. AMG's turbo encabulator has now reached a high level of development and it's now been successfully used in the operation of Nova trunnions. Moreover, when a fluorescent score motion is required, it may also be used in conjunction with a drawn reciprocation dingle arm to reduce sinusoidal replenation. So should you buy one? Look, I know we've got this exclusively, but for the vast majority of us, sorry, but no, you shouldn't. The AMG ML63 EV is quite small, it's not all that practical, and it does unfortunately lack many of the appealing attributes of other EVs from the likes of Kia, Hyundai, and even Tesla. So we're sorry, but no, you shouldn't buy one. In fact, we'll go as far as saying that it seems like this car is far more suited to kids than adults. But even in saying that, buying one of these for your children in their formative years does run the risk of that child becoming like a materialistic brand obsessed asshole. Or maybe it's just a bit of fun. I suppose it just depends if you're a good parent or a shit one. And that raises the big question, would you buy one of these? Actually, would you buy this exact car because we are selling this and any money that we raise from it is gonna to go to the Cancer Council because we're actually sponsoring the Nut Truckers team in the Australian Shitbox Rally raising money for the Cancer Council. So if you'd like to help us raise money for the Cancer Council, click on the link below and buy this to see what goes wrong with them, what they like to live with on a daily basis, what they like to drive. But, 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 but what we have here is the very latest in EV. In fact, it might even be smaller than the current Suzuki Jimny. And I've gone blank on the rest of the line. Look, it's going to depend in... Yeah, yeah, yeah.